I'm Christopher Chamnus with Carl Stortz, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us on behalf of Colorado State University's new Translational Medicine Institute. Before we get started, I'd like to inform you that this webinar is being recorded, and the recordings will be available at endoscopytalks.com for viewing in the future. Furthermore, all microphones and cameras of the participants have been disabled for the duration of this webinar, so you don't need to worry about being seen or heard. That being said, if you would like to submit a question for the speaker during the presentation, we encourage you to do so by typing your questions into the Q&A window. You can find that window by hovering your mouse over the lower portion of the Zoom interface. Please do submit any and all questions that you may have for the speaker as I will be asking the speaker to answer as many of those questions as possible during the time that we have. Last but not least, I would like to thank the speakers for this entire Endoscopy Talk series. Each of them has volunteered their time to present their talks, so we are very grateful to each of them as this series, series would not be possible without their generosity and their expertise. Today, Professor Rob Rosichuk is joining us to discuss how he uses video otoscopy. Dr. Rosichuk is a staff member at the Colorado State University College of Veterinary Medicine, where he is a professor, the service chief of the Dermatology and Otology Service, and the head of specialty services. He has been instrumental in pioneering the use of video otoscopy in the diagnosis and management of canine and feline ear disease, and he continues to maintain a very busy clinical otology service at the university, utilizing this technology. He has provided continuing education in otology and dermatology for vets throughout the US, Canada, and several countries in Asia and Europe. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Rosichuk. Thanks very much, Christopher. Wonderful being here today and uh, virtually uh, interacting with everybody, uh, talking about uh, something I enjoy doing uh, pretty much uh, more than anything else, and that is uh, working with ears. And uh, basically what uh, has stoked that interest and uh, perpetuated that uh, over these many years uh, has been uh, video autoscopy. And uh, so today, uh, basically, uh, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to give you uh, a little bit of a feel for how I use my video autoscope, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the equipment uh, uh, that I use uh, with it, uh, and then uh, basically our uh, uses uh, in the exam room, and then uh, we'll go through a number of uh, procedures. Uh, we'll certainly uh, give you time to uh, uh, basically uh, ask any questions you might have about uh, some of the things uh, that we're getting into here. First of all, obviously, we have to have a video otoscope, and uh, I do use a Storrs uh, scope. Uh, I'm privileged to have uh, uh, a large uh, high definition uh, unit. Uh, this uh, uh, video otoscope obviously attached to a camera and then allows for capture of uh, uh, pictures, uh, allows obviously for visualizing what we're uh, doing in ears, and uh, it's not uh, uh, necessary, uh, that is, uh, some of the high powered. Uh, instrumentation that uh, we might use. There are other options for you. Now, it might be uh, somewhat less expensive. Uh, still allow you to take advantage of this uh, wonderful uh, technology. Um, things that I use with my video autoscope, uh, grasping forceps uh, are worth their weight in gold. Uh, I actually uh, have uh, both the uh, three French and five French uh, grasping forceps, and I must admit, I use them interchangeably uh, all the time. Uh, the smaller uh, for cats and small dogs, working in the middle ears of uh, all individuals. And um, as I said, uh, a very, very integral part of what I uh, do. Biopsy forceps, of course, uh, uh, very important uh, as well. I must admit, I uh, use another uh, type of uh, forcep, uh, biopsy forcep. Uh, there's a Storrs biopsy forcep that is not used through the video otoscope. It's actually used through a handheld otoscope, uh, but it is a much larger biopsy forcep, and it does uh, allow me to debulk uh, masses uh, much more quickly and effectively. 
and uh, then I uh, use my video otoscope to uh, basically uh, get into the ear uh, to uh, mop up on uh, material, or I should say uh, masses, etc., that I might be uh, removing. As far as flushing uh, through uh, the unit is uh, concerned, uh, the catheters that I use uh, are polypropylene urethral catheters. Uh, Covidian is the source for the catheters we use. Uh, actually, uh, uh, prefer these because of their rigidity. I like the rigidity associated with these uh, uh, five French uh, catheters that are able to get through our working channel. And uh, uh, basically, uh, these can be cut down. Uh, uh, we do two, use two different uh, uh, sizes, shorter ones, when we're just working through the working channel without an adapter added to the uh, uh, to the video otoscope. But when we're working through or with an adapter, uh, we uh, basically require a longer catheter. And uh, so we cut uh, those down uh, to a longer uh, length. Again, the six and a half, seven, 10, 11 inches, uh, what we're talking about there. Uh, we do use ear curettes. Um, these are a storage item as well. Uh, we tend to use the smaller curette most commonly through the video otoscope. You can retrograde a, uh, a larger curette uh, uh, through the scope. We don't tend to use that uh, very much. And, and to be honest with you, the curettes, I don't tend to use uh, that commonly. Uh, there is an adapter uh, associated with our video otoscope uh, that uh, does allow for two ports. Uh, one port that allows for fluid administration. Uh, while well, the other allows you to pass your instrumentation. And uh, basically running fluids at the same time that we're doing procedures is something that uh, I do quite commonly. Uh, I really think it's uh, of value uh, while you're working in the ear. It minimizes fogging, debris getting on your lens. Uh, basically, if something is bleeding, it has a tendency to flush that blood out so that you can continue to work in the ear and while you run fluids, which is just saline, uh, basically it also tends to expand the canal uh, somewhat a little bit, magnifies your uh, uh, view, certainly clears it. And you can pass instrumentation through and do uh, procedures uh, basically while fluids are running, uh, usually just by gravity flow. Uh, you can use compression if you want to, uh, a little more in the way of uh, uh, fluid flow, but uh, for us, usually gravity flow is all we need. Probably what is a pretty uh, priceless piece of uh, instrumentation for me uh, as well is uh, some method of uh, allowing you to both flush and uh, suction in the uh, ear. And the vet pump too uh, is very well positioned uh, to do that. Uh, basically allows for controllable uh, flushing, that is uh, the uh, uh, pressures uh, that are generated and also the negative pressure, uh, a controllable uh, suction uh, potential as well. And uh, to be very honest with you with uh, respect to cleaning ears, uh, this is uh, worth, as I said, its weight in gold. Uh, for myringotomies, uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, I have a tendency to uh, uh, use um, a spinal needle to uh, uh, initiate my myringotomies, a very nice sharp tip so that I can get a, a start uh, uh, in uh, my movement through the uh, tympanum. 22 gauge six, uh, six inch uh, uh, myringotomy needle is what I tend to use. Storage also has a, a needle that, uh, uh, that could serve in a similar fashion. Um, we also uh, use a five, inch, a five French uh, polypropylene uh, urethral catheter. And uh, there's a lot of people that, uh, to be honest with you, don't bother with the, uh, uh, with the uh, needle and would just go to the uh, urethral catheter. Uh, if you happen to be one of those, uh, uh, the way I tend to make them more effective is to cut uh, the angle of the tip or cut an angle to the uh, tip of the uh, uh, catheter, a 45 degree angle. So again, so you can purchase the tympanum uh, and uh, stand a better chance of going in where you would like to go with your myringotomy. Well, that's uh, what I tend to use as far as equipment is concerned. As far as how I use my video otoscope, well, first of all, uh, I virtually use my video otoscope for the examination of every patient that comes in uh, to our service. Of course, we do work in a specialty dermatology and autology service. 
all of our dermatologic cases receive an otoscopic examination, which I think is best medicine, uh, as far as uh, that is concerned because of the high incidence of association of skin disease and ear disease, allergic problems, for instance, very commonly being associated with otitis externa. So everybody gets a video otoscopic examination. And to be honest with you, we were able to uh, get a, a successful video otoscopic examination um, yeah, probably in at least 95% of the cases uh, that we look at, dogs and cats. Uh, obviously, the advantage that we have uh, with respect to uh, doing that examination in the, exa in the exam room with uh, the client is the client. So we take pictures of what we see, of course, and uh, clients are then able to visualize the pathologic changes that are present in the uh, ears. Uh, what is really helpful uh, in your exam room is uh, uh, basically a, a set of normals as to what the canals and the eardrum of a normal dog uh, should look like, uh, so owners can better appreciate the changes you're seeing in the uh, ear. Um, I think uh, as far as uh, that in exam room examination, and again, uh, having owners being able to see what they see, uh, it just uh, makes uh, everything so much uh, uh, easier, uh, basically enhancing compliance as far as uh, clients are concerned, um, better understanding what they're doing with respect to ear flushes, uh, uh, the benefits that medications might uh, produce. Very, very important in follow-up so they can see how good a job they're doing as far as that's concerned. So very uh, positive uh, reinforcement as far as what they've achieved and, and sometimes the opposite, uh, get an impression of about what they're what they haven't achieved. So for instance, a case like this, uh, where they've already been flushing and treating this ear uh, for several weeks, and we still have significant amount of debris in the ear, uh, it makes it very easy seeing this all pictorially to uh, get people, uh, people I should say, to buy into, uh, for instance, uh, deep ear cleaning. As far as uh, tips to success, I do think that uh, in the exam room, I think adequate restraint is very, very important. I think this is very well worth the time to have a technician come into the room to just uh, uh, basically uh, restrain the individual. Um, uh, that is very important uh, in order to get that exam uh, done. But as I said, it is well worth the technician time. Uh, sometimes it does take uh, somebody uh, with experience doing a two-hand uh, a hold on the nose, uh, moving the, uh, the uh, nose slightly into the thoracic inlet uh, so that we can get a, a good direct shot uh, into the ear as far as uh, doing our exam is concerned. I think a lot of people are frustrated in the exam room because as they look in the ear, basically things are foggy or debris gets onto the uh, uh, surface of their uh, scope. Uh, basically, that happens to all of us. Uh, the way we get around that is basically to clean our tip uh, repeatedly, uh, never accepting that sort of uh, foggy uh, look. Uh, you can achieve that with a defogger, uh, but uh, to be honest with you, we use uh, isopropyl alcohol for this purpose, uh, cleaning our scope tip. Um, and uh, if I get into an ear and I find that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, it is uh, foggy at all, I never go any further. Uh, basically come right out again, clean that tip with liberal amounts of uh, alcohol, and then back in the ear again. And once again, if it's foggy, I'll just come out and keep doing that until I get a good uh, clear view. Uh, the advantage of alcohol as well is obviously it's antimicrobial um, uh, capabilities. And uh, uh, I must admit, uh, I think uh, uh, I, I can honestly say that I'm never, I have never been aware of our uh, inducing an iatrogenic problem as far as uh, infections are concerned, moving scopes from individuals to individuals. And part of the reason I think that that is the case is because uh, we do use alcohol for this cleansing purposes, uh, purpose as often as we do. And so in uh, basically in the exam room, uh, we get that uh, uh, good examination in this kitty, allergic cat, otitis externa. So we get down in there, nice clear view of that surhumanolith that is uh, obstructing the canal. Um, yeah, the owners uh, did try uh, add some at home flushing to get that out. We couldn't have a clear indication for uh, getting into doing a deep ear cleaning with that kitty. 
the other, I guess, uh, point that I'd have to make with respect to being successful in doing your examinations is that you have to force yourself to do it. You've got to do it over and over and over again. This is definitely a situation in which practice makes perfect. And uh, that's just the best way to achieve uh, those uh, ends. In exam room, um, basically work. Now, uh, I am going to just uh, see if you have any questions uh, about what I've just said there. Just so happens that we're having a little bit of trouble uh, communicating uh, here. And so I'm going to have to put my uh, phone up to my ear in order to hear uh, Christopher. And he is going to tell me what questions we might, if there are any. So technology failed us here just a little bit. You still yes. with me, Christopher? Yes, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Very good. Very well. First question. Do you see any issues with heat from the instrument causing discomfort in the awake patient? Uh, the question, yes. Uh, with respect to heat, and the answer to that question is no. I think as far as settings are concerned, when we talk about uh, the lights, now we use a xenon light, which is potentially a very uh, bright light. Uh, settings usually no higher than 45 or 50 is what we use routinely, uh, not only for our routine exams, but also for all our procedural stuff, and that is never an issue. Okay, next question. Um, what do you, I think you're going to get to this, but what do you, what are you using to flush the ear? What are you flushing the ear with? Yeah, we're going to, we'll, we'll get to that already. We're primarily talking about uh, the saline and our, uh, uh, but we'll get into ear cleaning, as a matter of fact, next. Okay, and one more question here. Um, how do you bill for otoscopy, considering the cost of the equipment and cleaning? How do you, at each appointment, how do you bill for these procedures? You know, what we did, as far as the exam is uh, concerned, we uh, actually added for uh, probably uh, a few years, we added on a fee for every examination. Basically, it was a standard $10 fee. And uh, now we've just built it into our examinations because uh, basically it's what we do routinely on every exam. Uh, again, dermatologic exam. So we do, we do consider that and do bill for it. Very good. One last question, Rod. What are your recommendations for cleaning and disinfection of the video otoscope? Uh, yeah, what we uh, tend to do uh, is uh, routinely after our examinations, uh, the scope is cleaned with uh, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, that isopropyl alcohol is also run through the working channel, even though we haven't used it. We've just used it in the exam room. We run the uh, uh, cleaning brush through the uh, working channel. And uh, if it has been, let's say, a clean ear, that is all we do. Uh, if there are secondary infection issues, uh, we use a 1% Novasan solution in the same fashion to clean up the, uh, uh, both the outer aspects of the uh, scope and the channel after that. Uh, uh, nowadays, I might also add uh, that uh, we are also cleaning our handles after every uh, uh, examination with uh, Virex 2256 in the land of COVID. And uh, uh, to be honest with you, we did that uh, uh, quite frequently as well, even before COVID, but now we do tend to do that routinely. Great. That's it for now, Rob. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about some of those uh, procedures. First of all, just a few uh, points to make with respect to some of our procedural uh, stuff. Uh, when we work uh, with video otoscopes, uh, uh, basically one thing that's uh, very important uh, to remember is that our we have a working channel that uh, is on the dorsal or top part of our uh, otoscope. It comes out then at 12 o'clock uh, with the lens being beneath it. And uh, I'll just give you my uh, bias here a little bit. When I'm working in ears and doing procedural stuff, as the otoscopist running the video otoscope, uh, basically, uh, and so that would mean the dorsal aspect of the scope is uh, uh, pointed away from me. Uh, I like to work from what I call the back of the head. And the reason I, I do that uh, is uh, basically when instrumentation comes uh, uh, out of my video otoscope, it has a tendency 
uh, to come out towards the top of my screen. Now, when I work from the back of the head, uh, everything on your screen will be upside down. So for instance, here's a tympanum, and this is the pars flaccida, and here's pars tensa. And uh, the, the bottom line is uh, my instrumentation, if it comes out, uh, will always be in this more dorsal area, which actually turns out to be the ventral aspect of the tympanum. And recall, when we uh, go through the uh, tympanum, we get into the middle ear, we always want to stay ventral in the middle ear, stay away from all the sensitive structures of the middle ear because they are all dorsal. And so basically, it's just a sort of a natural uh, way of protecting uh, myself as I come out in the ear. And to be very honest with you, I think uh, this also allows me to hold the scope and uh, the uh, uh, pin in one hand if I happen to be doing procedures uh, by myself, uh, or it also seems to give me a better view of the uh, tympanum. Um, we also recognize that you can change the orientation of that exit point so that you can move uh, your uh, grasping forceps, your uh, uh, flushing catheter to different areas just by essentially changing uh, where that uh, opening is. You can do that with the storage units because you can spin uh, the uh, scope uh, on the camera uh, just by turning the channel. So you can change the orientation of your 12 o'clock here to move your instrumentation around in the ear. That's very helpful as well. I must admit, um, after having done this for a lot of years, I think the fastest and the most effective way of doing a lot of the procedural stuff that we're going to talk about right now is uh, basically to have two people doing the procedure. Uh, one person uh, running the video otoscope, that person is very, very important because they do orient uh, the instrumentation to where it uh, needs to get to. And the other individual is the individual that would pass the uh, catheter attached to, let's say, the vet pump tube for flushing purposes or grasping forceps or biopsy forceps or uh, et cetera. And uh, I think by doing so, I think you find you're gonna do a better job and what's probably more important than anything else, you're gonna do it faster uh, than you would if you were just trying to accomplish all of these ends uh, on your own. Here, we're just doing a little bit of flushing and they're about to uh, do that uh, two-person uh, process. As far as actual process, uh, procedures are concerned, well, what do I use my video otoscope for in our area? Well, this time of the year, we're taking grass-ons out of uh, uh, ears for many tractable individuals. Uh, you can do that with just uh, holding individuals down in lateral uh, recumbency. Uh, we have the advantage of having students around and put five people around an individual that's tractable and you don't need any sedation and you can do a good job of that. But uh, where you don't have those hands, uh, reasonably light sedation is often enough uh, to allow us to uh, basically do the uh, uh, foreign body removals that uh, we uh, need, in this case, uh, grass-ons. And I think that uh, the advantage that uh, a video autoscopy has here, of course, is that we are able to so much more readily visualize deeper in the ear uh, after we do our foreign body removal, as in this case, we still have a little bit of grass material that is laying right on top of the uh, tympanum. And here again, just with my sedation, I'm flushing through in this ear. Now I gotta admit, when I work in the tympanum area, it's a very sensitive area. I often need a little anesthesia if you happen to bounce up again the tympanum. In this particular case, just sedation was enough. And you're gonna see with my little three French uh, grasping forceps, just right in there, peel that right off the tympanum. So we do, this time of year, we do a fair number of uh, foreign body removals. Probably the thing that I do most uh, as far as frequency is concerned is uh, deep ear cleaning. And uh, this is ear cleaning not only of the canals, but uh, uh, not uncommonly in our service because we see a lot of complicated uh, ear issues, uh, also middle ear cleaning as well. And uh, for these procedures routinely, uh, we do feel very strongly that uh, we need general anesthesia. Uh, this is a very sensitive part of the body and uh, we're basically, that is a minimal stimulation in the area of the tympanum. Uh, we'll get an individual shaking their heads and uh, we can't tolerate that as we're working deeply in ears. Uh, so anesthesia is what we use and also prevents uh, potential for 
Aspiration, if we happen to be, again, flushing through a middle ear into the auditory tube in the posterior pharynx, uh, we'll uh, not encounter any complications related to that. For our deep ear cleanings, uh, basically we all start, we tend to start them out in a similar fashion, uh, and that is um, we usually uh, use our uh, long catheter or a catheter, I should say, attached to a syringe uh, to go deeply into the ear, uh, uh, much deeper than we'll achieve. Uh, uh, and what we're doing here is uh, getting some samples for cytology. Uh, sometimes what we get from deep within the horizontal canal is different than what uh, you'll see on your swabs of the vertical and the first part of the horizontal canal. And we'll take a sample and uh, basically uh, use that for cytology. Uh, if it looks like it may be a value, save some for potential culture as well. Uh, we'll also make the point here that if we get down to the tympanum and we get uh, into the middle ear, because it is uh, perforated, uh, basically the first thing we do all the time is again sample for both cytology and uh, potential culture uh, as soon as we get into the uh, into the middle ear. Uh, basically, as far as uh, then cleaning is concerned, well, this is where the vet pump pays for itself over and over and over again. Flushing and suctioning, flushing alone is amazing as far as uh, what it's able to achieve. Uh, this is a pseudomonas ear. The last one was just an anesthesia ear. Uh, basically, uh, uh, heavy, Wax accumulations. Now, many people, even with uh, heavy wax accumulations, uh, will sometimes use an earbulb syringe, flush the ear first, get that stuff out. With good pressure uh, through, for instance, the vet pump, you do an exceptionally good job uh, of moving material out uh, uh, of the ears. Here we have a, a pathologic tympanum, uh, a more opaque and it should be because material has been sitting on its uh, surface, so it's, uh, ir it's irritated and thickened. Uh, that's the pars flaccid up here. Very nicely uh, cleaned uh, uh, ear. And uh, another pseudomonas ear, uh, um, and again, flushing, just flushing. Now, making my point, this, we've just uh, uh, been just using flushes in this ear and the suction uh, with the uh, vet pump uh, too. Uh, here's an ear that's quite stenotic. Uh, this is where I make my point that especially with debris that's been in ears for long periods of time, you have to be patient. You flush and flush and flush. You keep the flush and running through that ear. And uh, uh, the bottom line here is uh, give it time. It's, uh, this material has been lodged in these ears for two, three years sometimes. It takes time to move it out. Oh, you can barely see this eardrum. That's an intact eardrum way down there. Flushing uh, large volumes of fluid is what uh, basically uh, uh, does uh, wonders as far as this material is concerned. To give you an example, I did a, a deep ear cleaning, two ears, German Shepherd, chronic otitis, severe chronic proliferative otitis today. I went through three liters of saline flushing those uh, ears. Ah, but the grabbers are also huge too. And they do an excellent job. Once you loosen material up, sometimes it's a lot faster getting in there and grabbing that material. This material, after we removed it, was revealed a pretty trashed uh, tympanum. A lot of uh, overhydrated epithelial debris here and one little hole in the uh, into the middle ear, which uh, actually we expanded a little bit, uh, went into that uh, middle ear, and we'll talk about that in uh, just a little bit. Uh, my point here actually had more to do with those uh, grabbers. Uh, we very much do the flushing and then grabbing. If you get material that comes up, uh, not coming out very well with the flush, uh, get the grabbers in there. Uh, they'll sometimes uh, remove material a lot faster. This is actually working in a middle ear. So we're flushing now down into the middle ear and uh, uh, suctioning. And uh, basically, uh, this is uh, just with saline. It asks what we flush with, uh, and it is with saline. And uh, the bottom uh, line here is that uh, uh, this, oops, let me just finish this here a bit. We might have to come back on this a little bit more. Let's come way back over here. Got a little ahead of myself there. 
Yeah, we'll just come back here and yeah, about a moment. There we come again. Let's see if I can't move this a little faster. Okay, so we are down in this uh, middle ear now. And uh, flushing, there's some of that large amount of debris coming out of that uh, ear. This is still just flushing and uh, suctioning. And uh, basically here now we've got material that's not coming out very well. We're getting our uh, three French uh, grabbers down into the uh, middle ear, uh, grabbing material, noticing that we're always working ventrally uh, in the uh, in the ear. Uh, this for me when I'm usually working in the middle ear everything is upside down and uh, that middle ear what you're looking at right now way down deeply in there is some granulation over the medial wall of the middle ear. Uh, we've done a very good job of flushing and uh, suctioning uh, that material uh, out of the uh, uh, out of the middle ear. Um, as far as facilitation of uh, flushing is concerned, I must admit, uh, uh, with uh, debris, especially heavier waxy debris, I, I definitely will put a serum analytic uh, uh, in the uh, ear to soften uh, material. Uh, if it's uh, heavier wax, I tend to use uh, fatty acid related uh, uh, fl um, uh, serum analytics or softening agents, a product like Duxomicellar solution. We're talking uh, a uh, little more in the way of uh, exudates, uh, uh, secondary infections, uh, uh, products like uh, uh, malacetic uh, otic. Uh, these are products that uh, are safe if you do happen to get them in the middle ear. Another product I really like uh, to put in ears, uh, I will even uh, inject it into uh, deep wax uh, in uh, ears to soften up material to facilitate uh, it. Uh, removal uh, would be uh, squalene and a couple of commercial products that uh, uh, contain this. It's a heavy oil. Here I'm just injecting it down into the uh, wax of this stenotic uh, area and then uh, basically again uh, doing our uh, flushing, moving this material out, both flushing and, uh, and then uh, grabbing uh, in order to uh, get our material out. And uh, in this ear, uh, that is all the material that is um, removed there. Oh. And um, that tympanum was uh, still intact. All righty. Another moment, since ear cleaning always generates a lot of uh, questions, uh, any uh, queries about that? And I'll go back to the phones. Yes, we've got several good questions, Rod. First one is, how do you manage a stenotic or very painful ear canal? Okay, that's a really good question. How do you deal with a stenotic ear canal? And the answer to that question is uh, steroids. <laughs> so individuals with stenosis uh, are, are usually best managed. Uh, for us, it's, if it's very significant stenosis, with a combination of oral steroids, starting at uh, the higher end of anti-inflammatory dosage ranges, at least a milligram per kilogram uh, per day to begin with, and uh, usually more potent topical steroids as well. Uh, for instance, uh, something we use quite uh, frequently in stenotic ears is uh, synodic, uh, which contains flucinolone, a very potent steroid, and uh, DMSO. Uh, which actually takes that uh, uh, steroid into the tissue. Uh, to be very honest with you, when it comes to a deep ear cleaning, if I look into that ear and I feel stenosis is severe and it will compromise my ability to get deeper in that ear to clean the ear, I'll always pre-treat those individuals for a couple of weeks and then bring them back for that deep ear cleaning. Okay. Do you worry about rupturing an intact tympanum with copious flushing? Yeah, uh, also. And, and any worries causing vestibular signs post procedure with forceful flushing? Uh, the answer to that question is uh, I think it's uh, uh, very difficult, uh, first of all, to 
damage a tympanum that is normal with a flush. And I mean, I'm also honest with you, usually what happens uh, with many tympana in association with otitis externa, chronic otitis externa, they have a tendency to become somewhat thickened, even less likely to be damaged by flushing. And uh, for that reason, I would say, um, no, I think uh, the number of times that I've actually encountered a situation where in flushing, where I thought I, you know, induced a problem, well, I can count on less than one hand. And uh, I must admit, um, if uh, tympanum looks relatively good when I'm in an ear for flushing purposes, for instance, that German Shepherd I flushed today uh, with very chronic otitis, I was working on the tympanum at our full flush pressures in those ears, never even suggesting that it was a problem. Okay, so this is related. How often do you see a head tilt in your patients after large volume? Oh, as long as you... <laughs> Uh, knock on wood, here it is, knocking on wood. For me, it is extremely rare, and that's because I'm very careful. Now, if I had a question about a tympanum, if I questioned it, its integrity, then I'm going to be much less aggressive as far as flushing is concerned. And when we talk about, for instance, doing myringotomies and then putting a catheter into an ear where you don't have a big rent in the tympanum so the fluid can come out really readily, you've got to be much more careful about flushing pressures and use relatively minimal pressures for fear of inducing those very problems you talked about. Are there any contraindications to flushing the ear? Uh, contraindications to flushing the ear, I would say I, I've never found myself uh, uh, threatened by, yeah, no, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you're careful. Now, keep in mind, I mean, we we flush the ears of uh, some individuals uh, that have, for instance, lytic changes in the bulla wall of their middle ears. We'll flush out their canals very thoroughly using the pressures we've talked about here, sometimes fairly intense, but once we get into the middle ear, as far as flushing is concerned, our flushing pressures must be minimal. We don't want to drive material, for instance, through pathologic bone, etc. Yeah. Okay. Um, regarding that suction, do you use the suction from the machine or do you find the tubing isn't large enough for the larger bits of debris? We seem to have issues with blockages or inadequate suction. Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a good point. And uh, uh, to be honest with you, um, you the suction is, is compromised by that. But I'll tell you right now, what we usually do if we're having issues like that is we tend to use the graspers to get those bigger chunks of material out. And uh, that works very well. Does it, does it also work to just flush and let that debris come out on its own? Well, the, this is the point I made in all those initial uh, pictures of cleaning the ear. You'll be amazed what just flushing is able to move out of the ear. Mm -hmm. um, do you, how often do you use CT prior to video otoscopy? Mm. Um, with any uh, chronic uh, otitis externa where, for instance, uh, I can't visualize the tympanum, uh, or I have any suggestion that there's abnormalities of the tympanum or the middle ear, or there are any clinical symptomatologies that might suggest otitis media. To be very honest with you, we routinely do CTs on those individuals prior to cleaning. And uh, luckily, we have that available to us uh, uh, in very close proximity, obviously, to where we're practicing at the university. Uh, we do it routinely. We've been able to work out a uh, uh, sort of a reduced fee for doing CTs of only the bulla. And uh, uh, to be very honest, it's very helpful to know whether or not a tympanum is intact uh, in the sense that if uh, it is and you can't see the tympanum, it does make you uh, much more careful about how you're cleaning out that ear. 
uh, making sure that you don't traumatize the tympan. If there's something in the middle ear, you know you're going to be going into the middle ear anyway for cleaning purposes, and that's very helpful. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, even though they're pouring in. What time frame do you allow for flushing a problem ear? That is, what is your endpoint to discontinue a cleaning of the middle ear? I know it's infinity, right? It's a good question. You know, the, well, the, the truth of the matter is, it takes time. Uh, you know, I think for uh, a very severe ear and just cleaning two ears, uh, uh, I usually, we're talking an hour, hour 15, 20. Um, middle ears uh, sometimes take a little longer because I end up flushing. The key to middle ear cleaning is flushing large volumes of fluid through the ear very important and if you have to clean the canals plus the middle ears um, you know just one ear can take me an hour sounds good okay rod let's uh let's continue on we've only got okay. 15 minutes left got it okay all righty so mirangotomies people always talk about mirangotomies and uh, to be honest with you uh, we do them we don't do them that often uh, as far as uh, uh, myringotomies are concerned, they are, of course, done in situations where we have uh, an intact tympanum, and uh, we suspect that there might be something in the middle ear. Uh, so we're basically going to uh, put a needle or catheter in through the intact tympanum into the middle ear for both sampling purposes and uh, uh, also potentially for culture and sensitivity. And then if there is pathology, we'll usually open up a slightly bigger hole in the tympanum and flush out the middle ear. As far as myringotomies are, are concerned, uh, again, what's really, really important with myringotomies is that ears should be very clean and very dry prior to doing a myringotomy. And for doing them, as I mentioned before, uh, I tend to start my myringotomies with a uh, spinal needle, nice, clean, a uh, small hole allows uh, uh, me to then subsequently put a, a polypropylene uh, uh, urethral catheter into that hole. Um, uh, these are attached to a uh, uh, syringe. Uh, where do we see this intact tympanum with suspicion of otitis, or I should say otitis media? Probably more so in cats actually than dogs with otitis media, otitis interna. Um, in this cat, good examples, pathologic tympanum right here. This cat, uh, very opaque, uh, somewhat neovascularized. Another cat with otitis media intact tympanum, very opaque, neovascularized. Uh, cat with a dilated pars flaccida. Um, and I can't see the pars tensa here. Don't see that very often, uh, but this is all intact, all related to otitis media uh, in uh, these kitties. Um, intact tympanum, and the dog, uh, requiring myringotomy not as often. Uh, do we see that? Uh, we do see it, uh, of course, with so-called primary secretor otitis media, uh, often associated with, uh, well, usually associated with certain breeds like Cavalier King Charles Spaniels will be doing myringotomies. Um, otitis media in uh, dogs, uh, sometimes associated with an intact tympanum, in this case, uh, bulging pars flaccida and we'll do a myriotomy in this bulging pars flaccida. This may bulge uh, even if the pars tensa is intact or not intact. So these are all scenarios where when we do a myringotomy. Uh, basically our myringotomies, uh, recalling that all our sensitive structures are uh, dorsal in the ear, always uh, perform caudal ventrally. This is the dog, kitty tympanum, a normal tympanum, where we would go. And uh, basically, Here's a kitty that uh, we're doing our myringotomy in. I've still got my spinal needle on a syringe. Uh, just gonna make my hole. It should go caudal uh, ventrally to the uh, handle of the malleus, which is up in this area here. And um, made a nice little hole there. We're gonna go back in with a uh, uh, five French catheter. We're gonna sample here, just suction. Uh, getting some material from the middle ear for cytology culture. I'll often make a slightly bigger hole in that uh, 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 tympanum, and then we'll flush the material out of the uh, uh, kitty's ear. 
I think that's very valuable as far as management uh, is uh, concerned. You have to have a big enough hole so that that fluid uh, and debris can come out. You can see this debris coming out. I'll show you a uh, uh, another uh, kitty here that uh, uh, basically uh, gives us a little better return as far as uh, uh, the flush is concerned. That's the size of hole we're talking about here uh, to flush this middle ear. Uh, this uh, kitty coming up. Uh, is a very abnormal tympanum. And as soon as we get the flesh going here, this is the happy mucoid material coming out of the middle ear uh, in this cap uh, associated with its otitis media. And we just keep flushing until that is clear. Near uh, again, uh, the management of middle ear effusion, so-called primary secretory otitis uh, media. This Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with a dilated pars flaccid it is filled with mucus. Uh, nowadays, I do actually do a little myringotomy on that, make a little hole in that. You can try to suck that material out even through your uh, needle here. Uh, catheter doesn't make a hole in your dilated pars flaccid as very well. You can, uh, and if you have an issue sucking that out, I just squeeze the stuff out. And then we drop our catheter in, caudal uh, ventrally again. Uh, and uh, create our hole and uh, essentially flush that mucoid material out of the uh, middle ear. This is uh, basically another, this is a dilated pars flaccida and uh, I don't want to belabor this too much, but uh, again, when you put a hole in the tympanum here with this pars flaccida, this is dorsal, this dog has otitis media. Um, and uh, dorsally, it's attached, the pars flaccida. Ventrally, it's not. That's what I'm just showing you here. And uh, did our little uh, needle uh, myringotomy here. But uh, a lot of times, again, this material uh, doesn't come out of those uh, small holes very well. These tympana are very pathologic. Usually, they're very thickened. Uh, nowadays, uh, what I find myself is making a bigger hole in that pars flaccida. And we do that with our biopsy forceps, basically grabbing that pars flaccida in its more ventral uh, orientation. And uh, you see as I pull this hole open here, uh, that material will pop out of that uh, dilated pars uh, flaccida. And we'll flush that material out. Oftentimes the tympanum may or may not be intact uh, behind this dilated pars flaccida. This one, it wasn't. And uh, then we had material extending into the middle ear, and we ended up having to go into that ear to clean that material. I'm just going to pass beyond that uh, uh, since we're, we've got a little more limited time. Just talk a little bit about biopsies and uh, uh, mass removals in uh, ears. And uh, biopsying through the uh, video otoscope, it's around smaller biopsy unit, you'll take off smaller chunks usually of masses, uh, which means that you might have to put them in a cassette uh, for people to look at histologically. Um, actually, this is why I like to debulk through a handheld scope uh, uh, using these larger forceps. Uh, but uh, even, uh, for instance, this is a, uh, a mass in uh, an ear, it's a serumenous adenocarcinoma in a dog. Uh, this dog, I might also add, if you look uh, over here had a serumen cyst as well. I've already pulled that cyst out. And uh, actually what I'm gonna do is uh, just show you again, just pulling at that, uh, pulling again. And uh, we wanna remove as much of that base as we can. And uh, this is what we achieved. Uh, pulled off the serumen cyst right at the base, uh, pulled this uh, lesion off as well. Two years later, this is a, a potentially a malignant tumor, no regrowth here. I'm not sure why way down here in the corner where we took off the cyst, there was a little thickening in that area. It never amounted to anything. I've looked at this cat, or dog, I should say, for two years hence, uh, and uh, no more activity in that area. Uh, using, again, major debulking, uh, smaller masses uh, through the video otoscope here. We're just taking proliferative lesions from the Cocker Spaniel's ear, pre and post. A uh, little bleeding to begin with. Uh, actually running fluids while you're doing this 
it's very helpful to clear your uh, views. Uh, somebody has already asked about uh, serimonous gland cysts in, in kitties' ears, and we know that some cats are prone to what we call uh, serimonous systematosis. And uh, the long and the short of it is, uh, we know that these are pretty easy to deal with. Uh, for instance, out here, you just uh, lance them, you can cauterize them with silver nitrate, just the inner aspect of that. Uh, you can uh, just do about anything, freeze them, you can uh, laser them, and uh, they uh, usually don't uh, uh, come back. In the ear, um, uh, actually, if you pull away the cystic structure right to the base, pretty much as I just showed you in that dog ear, uh, actually, our incidence of regrowth uh, uh, tends to be low uh, with these uh, uh, cysts. Uh, what is also important for you to remember about uh, serumenous cysts is that uh, um, many individuals that have this problem also have concurrent allergic otitis, and there is no question that allergy-related inflammation in the ear will make these cysts worse, they'll make them larger. And if you control the allergy-related inflammation in the ears, uh, topical steroid therapy, um, and uh, that is for long-term uh, therapy, you can often uh, reduce or at least minimize uh, uh, sort of the growth of these uh, uh, cysts in individuals who are prone to, their, uh, to this uh, problem. Uh, another uh, procedure, uh, mass-wise, that we get into, uh, reasonably uh, frequently uh, is removing uh, oral polyps. And uh, uh, basically, uh, polyps, as uh, you know, originate from the uh, middle ear of cats. They usually come from the more dorsal aspect of what we call the tympanic cavity, that area just behind uh, where the tympanum uh, is. Uh, they often fill up the middle ear and then uh, either grow out through the tympanum or potentially down through the uh, auditory tube into the posterior pharynx. Um, uh, rarely, or just in five or 10% of the cases, maybe uh, both. Most of what we tend to see are those that are oral uh, polyps that uh, basically uh, uh, extend into the ear canal, as you're seeing here. And uh, basically, as far as removal uh, is concerned, our management of uh, uh, oral polyps is essentially uh, traction and avulsion. Uh, I know there's still a lot of people who feel that this is a surgical disease, but it need not be in the vast majority of cases. Um, this is, uh, again, where I tend to use these storf, uh, fi uh, forceps uh, to uh, grasp the polyp uh, through an operating otoscope or handheld otoscope, a uh, larger cone, and uh, get a grab on that and yank. Usually it takes a, a lot of uh, yanking. Uh, to sometimes uh, remove these. Um, and uh, we use uh, the video uh, otoscope then in our biopsy forceps uh, to go in. So this, uh, we're just running some fluids, just showing the uh, uh, polyp here. And then I'll gone in and uh, we'll have grabbed this and yanked the majority of it off. And then uh, gone in with our biopsy forceps and we'll take all of that polypoid material off right to, but not any further than the tympanum. So maybe just a little bit into the hole in the tympanum that is created by the uh, polyp. We don't try to get all the material uh, out of the ear beyond that point. And uh, so just uh, removing all of that material, and this is uh, kind of what uh, uh, things uh, look like after we've uh, taken it out. You can see the hole. Uh, actually, a lot of that polypoid material came out even from the uh, middle ear. A lot of times you'll just see some red uh, material, which is the inflammatory uh, material there. Uh, really not uh, uh, an issue. The secret, the secret, and this is the secret to dealing with this problem, is this. Um, you have to follow up uh, uh, these uh, therapies with oral steroid therapy. That is what keeps the vast majority, what it does is it shrinks down the polyp material that uh, is remaining in the middle ear so that they don't regrow. And uh, I might say that uh, uh, we're just about to publish on something like 22 or 25 uh, cats uh, that 
uh, we've managed in this fashion. Again, with oral steroids, usually they are on a topical uh, steroid as well. The steroid uh, may contain an antibiotic if there's a secondary bacterial infection of the uh, middle ear. And uh, if there was a secondary uh, infection of the uh, middle ear, often an oral antibiotic as well. And uh, uh, the bottom line is uh, uh, that six to eight week duration of uh, oral steroid therapy, as I said, uh, in that uh, study group, basically prevented regrowth from occurring in uh, virtually, actually in that group, all of the uh, treated individuals. And uh, so the, uh, the long and the short of it is, uh, can be a very uh, beneficial uh, uh, method of managing uh, the problem. Uh, again, without uh, all the surgical angst and whatnot associated with uh, management of oral polyps. And with that, uh, we'll pause for the last time and open things up to questions. Okay, I've got several more questions for you, Dr. Rosie Chuck. First, do you ever use local nerve blocks of the greater auricular nerve when performing procedures in ears? Uh, the answer to that question, Yes, the answer to that question is yes, we do routinely. Uh, anytime uh, we are going to be working in the area of the uh, tympanum uh, in dogs and cats, we'll routinely block. Okay. What is your infection rate, infection recurrence rate after an ear flush, and what do you recommend to prevent those recurrences? Well, you know, uh, as far as infections are concerned, if we're talking about just otitis externa, the thing that's really important to realize is that there's an underlying reason that the individual developed the otitis and the secondary infection to begin with. And so we'll mop up the, and most commonly that's allergic disease. And so the take home message here is we mop up on that infection but then we have to do something to control that allergy-related uh, otitis externa to make the ear less prone to the development of secondary infections. So it's very common for us, for allergic ears, for instance, to be uh, doing a topical maintenance therapy with a topical steroid, for instance, uh, dexamethasone, uh, sodium phosphate, the four milligram per mil stuff, um, usually that diluted with saline, two parts dex, one part saline, uh, you know, golden retriever sized individual, 0.5 to 0.7 mils twice a week, long term indefinitely. And uh, take home message, you're controlling the allergic problem. That's what keeps the infection from coming back. Okay. In the very diseased ears, it's sometimes difficult to appreciate where the tympanic membrane would have been. How concerned should we be about inadvertently pushing material from the uh, external ear into the middle ear? In our GP clinic, we often stop once we feel like we've reached the middle ear for fear of doing more damage. Well, and that you do have to uh, respect the fact that you can you can traumatize the, tympan the tympanum, obviously. If uh, you can't visualize it, you go too far with any of your instrumentation. You know, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> the only time that that is an issue if you, is if you uh, potentially get into a very stenotic situation where you, with a video otoscope, can't visualize that deeply. And, um, I think in a situation like that, I think uh, if you can't uh, uh, visualize the tympanum, you use your best judgment as to about how thick, how deep you think that tympanum may be. And yeah, if you're not sure, you stop. Then you work at treating the ear, opening up the canal. And to be honest with you, uh, a lot of times uh, that's going to be enough and the debris that you might have left in that ear. Uh, is not going to be an issue. You may get that out, you know, with flushing down the road. Um, I think if you work at cleaning the ears the way I've just talked about it right now, you shouldn't be up against that wall in most ear cases. You'll get to the tympanum. You will appreciate it. You will get there and see it. And what if what if the tympanum's already been ruptured? How does that change your plan when you get there and discover that? 
Well, the first, the first thing we do is we do cytology and culture to know what it is we're going to be treating as far as secondary infections are concerned in the ear, and then maintaining a ventral orientation with our instrumentation. We'll flush and suction and grab the debris out of that uh, ear as well as we can. I might add, in middle ears, it's not uncommon for me. There's often some whitish opalescent epithelial debris that accumulates in those patients with chronic otitis media. If I can't get all of that material out of a middle ear, I don't worry about it. Flush large volumes of fluid through the middle ear, and a lot of that stuff biodegrades and takes care of itself. And at what point in the most chronic cases where you see calcification, how do you decide this is no longer a medically treatable dog and refer it to surgery? If an ear can't be opened up, if you have such severe stenosis associated with not only thickening of the lining of the ear canal, but those ears uh, are often ossified, and that ossification of the auricular cartilage and periauricular tissue also expands and narrows uh, the lumen of the canal. If those changes are permanent, you cannot open up the canal so that you can get all of that debris out of the ears and get medications down into the ears, and you will be maintaining medication in those ears indefinitely. If you can't open up those canals, then you're not doing any service to the uh, dog by just trying to medically manage them. They deserve surgery. Okay. Do you collect your samples for culture before flushing or do you use the debris from the flushing? Uh, actually, I always uh, initiate my deep ear cleaning as deep as I can go in the ear with, uh, again, uh, aspirating some material, and I save that for culture. I might not even use it, depending on what I see in my cytology and all that, uh, but I, I do sample deeply in the canal before I do any flushing. Then, if I am flushing and I find that I am going to be in the middle ear because it is a perforated tympanum, the first thing I do is stop my flushing, and go ahead and again sample from the middle ear, cytology and culture. Makes sense. How do you clean the ear canal and get rid of the adherent fatty purulent debris of a pseudomonas case with all those deposits in the ear canal? You know, uh, that, a lot of that uh, tends to be biofilm and uh, exudates uh, biofilm and, and people, you know, classically say that biofilm is, is very uh, difficult to uh, remove. Um, I think that the flushing, just saline, large quantities of uh, saline, one of our aqueous-based ear cleansers like the malacetic, uh, um, or I should say, um, uh, yeah, uh, Malacat Plus, for instance, um, and uh, uh, the, the long and the short of that is that is a cleanser, large volume flushing. I usually don't require anything more than that. Some people use acetylcysteine, etc. I just never had to get to that. And I, I've tried it, I might, I'd add, but I usually don't need it. Okay. Do you have any particular kinds of drops you'd like to use after video otoscopy? And this person wants to know what's safe if the eardrum is ruptured? Well, uh, yes, uh, and, and, and the integrity of the tympanum is uh, very important in making that decision because if the eardrum is intact, then I don't really care what I put in the ear. It can be any of the proprietary preparations. If you have bacteria and malassezia, it can be uh, Mometamax, Sotomax. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, these products, of course, though, if you have a perforated tympanum, have the potential to be autotoxic. The safer products that we put in ears are usually compa compounded solutions. And uh, uh, for us, uh, these are usually combinations, for instance, for uh, bacterial uh, otitis externa. Uh, this would be enrofloxacin, 
the small animal enrofloxacin, uh, dexamethasone sodium uh, phosphate, usually one part enro, two parts dex. Uh, if it's uh, malassezia, it's usually uh, one part uh, uh, myconazole, I should say 1% myconazole, one part myconazole, one part uh, dex. Uh, if it's a combination of both bacteria and malassezia, that mixes usually uh, one part enrofloxacin, two parts uh, myconazole, one part uh, dex. And we use larger volumes of those solutions, uh, anywhere from 0.5 to 1 mil, depending on the size of the ear. Okay, I think I'll make the next question the last. Do you use a laser in the ear? What type of laser do you use through the video otoscope? I have uh, used a CO2 uh, laser. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't uh, laser uh, very often at all in ears. Uh, that has just not been my forte. To be very honest with you, I just haven't had the need to do it. And uh, so I, I'm not the one to basically give you a lot of good tips regarding uh, laser management. I, I will mention that one of the upcoming talks, I believe it's August 12th, will be the entire talk is on use of lasers through endoscopes. I would imagine that will include some ears. Um, let's Probably. See. Dr. Rosie Chuck. Okay, let me ask you one more. Um, any comments on otoscopy in exotic animals? No, I'll be very honest with you. I, I do uh, a few uh, otoscopy procedures in rabbits. Uh, of course, they have a relatively high incidence of uh, middle ear disease, inner ear disease. Uh, ferrets, occasional ferrets. Uh, I'm definitely allergic to guinea pigs, but uh, I have still done a couple. I have no, I do everything in a very conventional fashion through my scope and uh, no real tips that uh, I would find uh, valuable, I guess, there. Okay, and I will mention there will also be uh, talks coming up by exotics experts uh, who use endoscopes as well. Dr. Rosie Chuck, once again, I'd like to thank you and also thank everyone in the audience for joining us for this Endoscopy Talks webinar. It has been recorded, as I mentioned, and can be viewed at endoscopytalks.com. Also, Dr. Tweed's lecture, which was given last week on laparoscopic, uh, laparoscopic organ biopsy, will also be available to view online at endoscopytalks.com. Next week, we'll be joined by Phil Mayhew, who will speak on laparoscopic treatment of GERD and hiatal hernia. This talk promises to reveal some relatively new information on laparoscopic therapies for these conditions. So I'd encourage you to join us. Please remember to submit your questions, which can also be submitted in advance when you register for this event at endoscopytalks.com. That is next Wednesday, June 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, also New York time. Actually, it's uh, at noon uh, Mountain Time next week. I got that one wrong. I'm really glad you corrected me. That would be 2 p.m. Okay, correction. Next week's webinar is at 2 p.m. Eastern Time or New York time. So that's different than this, this session and last week's session. Okay, I uh, wish you all good Thanks practice. Thanks very much, guys. Yes. Oh, look forward to seeing you next week.